Welcome to Open Minds, a Freedom of Thought podcast series, interviewing the people who bring courage and independent thought to the challenges of today. Hello, Julia Mahoney. Hello, Josh. So welcome to the Freedom of Thought podcast slash videocast. Thank you. Um, my name is Josh Kleinfeld. I'm a law professor and a political philosopher at Northwestern University and at George Mason University. And uh, my guest today, folks, is Julia Mahoney, who is the John S. Battle Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. We're going to have a conversation today about two big topics, free markets and crony capitalism and freedom of thought in diverse professional worlds from universities to law firms to corporations to nonprofits to medicine. So, Julia, why don't we start with just who you are? Uh, can you tell us a bit about where you grew up? what you studied in college, what led you to law school, and what led you to be a law professor. Yes, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and I grew up mostly in Washington, DC. I was an American history major in college with special emphasis on the founding period and the early national period, where I learned a lot about, yes, crony capitalism, and how concerns about corruption, broadly defined, had helped animate the American Revolution, and what a great concern it's been ever since um, America gained its independence from Great Britain. Uh, I was generally interested in a lot of things uh, and didn't know what exactly I wanted to do, but I was quite convinced after my study of uh, early national sources and revolutionary and uh, sources that law school would uh, bring me a certain amount of analytical uh, training and discipline, and so it did. I started my career practicing law in New York, and then eventually I moved to Charlottesville and began teaching at the law school, and I found that I loved teaching. And when an opportunity came to apply for a job on the tenure track at the University of Virginia School of Law, I took it, and things worked out, and I've been there ever since. So as I look at your career, it's a very distinguished career, and it's a career where you've written and taught on a wide range of topics. I mean, from con law, constitutional law, to corporate law, to land regulation, to medical ethics, to law and feminism. You've, you've done it all. But there's a theme. I think there's a theme that ties it all together. Um, the theme is how government regulates markets. Uh, Markets require a legal backdrop. Even the freest of free markets requires property rights and contract rights to be enforced. And real markets require a lot more than that. Securities regulation, anti-fraud laws, uh, uh, bankruptcy and antitrust and beyond. Uh, your intellectual life, as far as I can tell, centers on this web of governmental regulation that uh, makes markets possible. Yes. And I think it's fair to say that the perspective is generally libertarian, the perspective you bring to it. But of course, any label is pretty uh, oversimplifying. Um, I think what I see in your work is a recognition that government can help or hinder free markets. And you want to make sure that in general, governmental regulation helps them function at their best. So is that a fair characterization? And could you put some meat on the bones with an example or two? Yes, I mean, it's it's right. It's, I think, a little incomplete in the sense that I would also add community to that. Mm, okay. I've done lots of work in the so-called third sector. Lots of my projects have touched on or directly involved the nonprofit sector. And the idea that, yes, we need to have well-functioning government, and you're absolutely right, that a well-functioning legal system undergirds functioning markets. Uh, in addition, though, we do need this third sector to coordinate altruistic behavior. Not that our political life isn't also, to a certain extent, a coordination of altruistic behavior, and not that markets are not important in coordinating community and altruistic behavior. They are. But these are very, very difficult problems. And so I pay a lot of attention to the institutions that enable people to cooperate in a productive way. That's uh, really interesting. And it's a wonderful transition to our first big topic. So why don't we get into it? Um, topic here is private power, free markets, and crony capitalism. And I want to start with a question that perplexes me and keeps me up at night, really does sometimes uh, occupy my thoughts when I'm trying to sleep. And I'm a lawyer and a philosopher, but not an economist. So I come at it uh, with agnostic puzzlement rather than clear conviction. But, but here it is. 
Growing up, I was taught that in conditions of free competition, there's a certain way businesses would operate. They would be profit maximizing. That's their raison d'etre, right? They'd be profit maximizing. And consequently, they'd be meritocratic. They, if you're hiring someone to, you know, captain a ship, you want the best captain you can get. You don't care who he votes for in November. Uh, if you're hiring someone to practice law, you want as skilled a lawyer as possible. They're, they were meritocratic, the thought would go, not because of some ideological commitment to meritocracy, but because of just the demands of profit maximization. And by the same token, uh, the thought was they wouldn't care much about your private life or about your private politics. Uh, they're not going to fire you because of who you vote for. Why would they? They don't care. It doesn't bear on the work you do for them that's uh, profitable. As to corporate politics or uh, institutional politics, I think the expectation was that the corporate world would be either non-ideological or slightly or moderately conservative Republican. So the, the non-ideological expectation is sort of symbolized in Michael Jordan's famous line about why he doesn't speak out more on politics. Jordan said, Republicans buy sneakers too. Great line. Um, the other expectation is kind of captured in these expectations of the 70s and 80s and 90s that Wall Street, that the Chamber of Commerce, that big business and even medium and small business would all be in favor of less regulation of business, lower taxes, uh, less redistribution of wealth, fewer worker protections, that broadly they'd be on the side of Republican conservative um, initiatives and against more redistribution, redistributionist kind of progressive initiatives. And that was part of this larger expectation of the, you know, Ronald Reagan, Milton Friedman era that um, free markets would translate to a free society, uh, that the invisible hand would lead not just to prosperity, but to political freedom. Uh, so that the picture was that the state is the source of oppressive power and the market is the solution to the oppressive power of the state. So you minimize the state, you maximize the market, thereby you maximize individual freedom. That's the big picture standing behind this. But reality doesn't seem to be conforming to these expectations. And you can look and see it in a hundred directions. And I want to take a few minutes here um, to lay out the evidence and then we'll get into our conversation. So start with the financial sector. These are companies that own and trade in stocks and other securities. And they're some of the largest and wealthiest companies in the world. You think of, you know, Goldman Sachs. Uh, or you think of, for example, BlackRock. BlackRock uh, owns a large portion of all of the stock in the world. It has $10 trillion in assets. And it encourages slash compels firms that it owns to uh, commit to various environmental, social, and governance causes, what's called ESG, which in corporate speak is the equivalent of diversity, equity, and uh, identity, uh, DEI, in um, university speak. Or look at the professional sector, law firms and hospitals, for example. My conservative students in law school are terrified of being outed at their law firms because they think, I think correctly, that they'll get passed over for work or get passed over as partners, that their professional prospects will be impinged if they're exposed. And there's evidence of that. The most famous is probably Paul Clement. Now, Paul Clement is the former Solicitor General, which for those of our listeners who don't know is sort of the biggest position you can have as a lawyer. And he's one of the most successful lawyers of our generation. He was working for Kirkland and Ellis, and he took a case to the Supreme Court. Um, it was a Second Amendment case. He was defending gun, uh, uh, um, gun companies. He won the case and then got fired for winning. Uh, hospitals. I, uh, I know of a major hospital. A friend of mine is a doctor there. They had a mandatory training on implicit bias. And as they were leaving, a doctor was overheard to say, I'm so sick of all this woke stuff. And he was uh, suspended and investigated for racism uh, on account of that remark. Or you look at big tech. Um, there are studies of political contributions by the workforce in big tech companies. At Netflix, 98% of employee contributions go to Democrats, 98. At NVIDIA, it's 93. At Adobe, it's 93. At IBM, 90. At Google slash Alphabet, it's 88. 
at Microsoft, it's 85 at Apple, it's 84. Essentially, all US tech companies valued at 100 billion or more are giving, the employees are giving 90% or more of their money to um, uh, Democratic candidates. If one turns to the media sector, including social media, uh, and so I'm thinking here about tech-based media like Twitter and Facebook, but also traditional media like book publishers and newspapers, the picture gets even more extreme and in some ways more disturbing because these companies have a special role in democratic speech. They're actually like the instrumentalities by which speech is communicated, just like planes, trains, and automobiles move people around. Uh, these companies move ideas around, they move speech around. Well, when the Hunter Biden laptop story broke in the New York Post, um, uh, it, the story was about um, Hunter Biden having corrupt or unsavory dealings with foreign governments and Joe Biden being possibly involved. And Joe Biden was at that time just a few months away from the election that would make him president. Twitter blocked the story. If you tried to tweet it, uh, your tweet would fail. This is Twitter before Elon Musk bought it. So that's quite directly interfering with the transmission of information, with speech, and it's entirely partisan. It's essentially election interference by a private corporation on behalf of one party's candidate for president. And it wasn't just Twitter. Facebook hid the uh, material. The Washington Post and New York Times disparaged and then buried the story. Subsequently, the story turned out to be true. And um, some of the companies, like the New York Times, printed retractions uh, of their former statements. But it was too late. The election was won. Or you've got the story of the Trump deplatforming. Uh, Twitter deplatformed a former president with 40 million or so uh, Americans listening. Um, and what I find interesting about that is it's almost impossible to explain from a profit motive. I mean, after all, their business depends on having lots of people following uh, influencers or well-known tweeters. You know, that's, that's the business. Trump was big business, 40 million followers. Uh, but they deplatformed him. Uh, there was this is where the story gets even more interesting. There was an effort then to create a new Twitter, a competitor with Twitter. That effort depended on Amazon servers, servers under Amazon's control, and Amazon spiked. They wouldn't sell their server space to the competitor to Twitter, which is also fascinating because it's so difficult to explain from a profit motive. I mean, the obvious thing to do if you can become a major competitor to Twitter is to do it. There's also evidence in this vein from Amazon's uh, handling of disfavored books. Uh, a book came out on the origins of the BLM or Black Lives Matter movement and Amazon prevented uh, ads from being placed on behalf of that book. Uh, books came out on transgenderism and Amazon either deshelved them or attempted to deshelve them right before the House vote on the Equality Act. Returning to our most traditional media of all, just standard book publishers, there are a plethora of books by historians responding to and critiquing the 1619 Project, and the book publishers are refusing to publish them, mo mostly because they're employees. They're often their entry and mid-level employees are protesting the book so vigorously that the, the publishers, Penguin and the like, just give in and say, we're not going to deal with this. So this is interesting because all of this is how free speech works on the ground and you're seeing it blocked by these companies. Looking beyond you know, big tech and the professions and the financial sector to just for-profit corporations generally, what you see is a lot of companies taking sides in the culture wars, even where their customers can be expected to be on the other side. So I'm thinking here of like NFL or Walmart or Target or Gillette or Martha Stewart. Uh, or Budweiser, uh, all of them have taken prominent positions on the progressive side of the culture wars, notwithstanding the fact that they can anticipate that some large portion of their customer base won't like that. Disney might be the most interesting example. So Ron DeSantis, Florida governor at the time, you know, uh, prohibits classroom discussion of sexual orientation at the elementary school level. Disney denounces his position and Disney ends up in a war with DeSantis over um, over this culture war issue. 
it might be that both of them wound up losers in that. Disney depends for its special tax status and uh, on on the government of Florida, which DeSantis headed, um, and might have alienated some customers. DeSantis took some hits too. But the bottom line is, why did Disney want to get into a fight like that? What was the uh, profit motive? And that's just the public facing side. Behind the scenes, it's even more extreme. You look at Coca-Cola, for example. Coca-Cola uh, at one point published um, a statement that it would only work with law firms that have a certain number of African-American partners. And it secured collaboration with a number of other corporations and started to es essentially insist that law firms uh, partner more African-Americans in order to uh, get Disney's business or Coca-Cola's business rather. Um, eventually, that uh, initiative was defeated because it was so manifestly illegal. Uh, but it's widely suspected that that sort of thing continues just in a quieter fashion. Turn from there to universities, and I think the instinct is to overlook how, how powerful universities are. Um, there's a lot of joking about academia and sort of presenting it as trivial. But in fact, if you just look at universities, at, like any other corporation, the first thing that pops out is they are immensely wealthy. Uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, these are multi-billion dollar organizations. The next thing that pops out is they're very large. They have tens of thousands of employees and hundreds of thousands of students, collectively millions of students. The third thing is they're very famous brand names, like Harvard and Yale. Those are as famous as any brand names in the world. Uh, travel the world and you see Harvard and Yale sweatshirts and t-shirts because the brands are well known. Unlike other corporations, universities certify members of the educated class. You know, Coca-Cola doesn't decide whether you or your children end up being five-figure earners or six or seven-figure earners, but Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford do. They do have that role of certifying uh, who gets to be in the elite of society. They also educate members of the educated class. So how do you think? What do you think about? Every public school teacher in America passes through the university system. This is a tremendous influence on ideas. Um, and they are overwhelmingly on the left. And uh, the evidence here is, well, we're both creatures of the university and we know very well how, um, how overwhelming the left-wing orientation is in universities. Uh, one study of the uh, highest ranked um, 66 liberal arts colleges, um, it was a study rather of 51 of those 66, 51 of which they could get data. So essentially call it the top 50. Uh, 25 of them had no Republican faculty at all. And those that did, it's tokenism. It's one out of 100. It's one out of 400. It's two out of 1,000, those kinds of numbers. Now, I don't say all this just to get conservative blood boiling. I, I want to get in an analytical question. I think we've learned something from recent history. Actually, we've learned two things from recent history. First, we've learned that the market is not politically indifferent. It's not conservative for sure, and it's not exclusively profit oriented. Instead, it's highly political, it's highly unified, it's left leaning or just left wing, and it's ready to act on those political preferences even where doing so is not profit maximizing, even where it's apparently costly. They're ready to sacrifice some customers. They're ready to sacrifice some profits. They're ready to get rid of some otherwise productive employees uh, in exchange for other goods, identitarian or ideological goods. And the second thing we've learned is that the state isn't the only source of oppressive power. I think private power today is a greater threat to freedom than public power. So all of this has been building towards a big question. This is the one that perplexes me and keeps me up at night. And I think it's a perfect question for you as someone who studies the interface between law uh, and markets. Is this the free market? Is what I've just described, is this the, how the free market really works? M maybe our Ronald Reagan, Milton Friedman expectations were just just wrong. That isn't how it works. Or is this not really the free market at all? Is this some market distortion uh, that I don't have a name for? Or maybe I do. Is this crony capitalism? A lot of it, yes. So get back to the 1980s and what the realistic expectations were.
we understood that there was a lot of sclerosis. Just stick with the United States economy for the moment. A lot of sclerosis in things like airlines and trucking and so forth. And even before Ronald Reagan took office, there were some very serious initiatives to right-size regulation in a lot of industries. The Reagan administration continued those initiatives, uh, but in terms of actually making the government significantly weaker, in terms of, quote, deregulation, it didn't accomplish that much. Hmm. Now, it was, still it was also understood back in the 1980s that we did not understand competitive markets perfectly and that there were some things in particular that needed a lot more work. Antitrust was one of the big, big questions. Early 1980s. Sorry, could you define as antitrust for our as listeners? In anti, as in having a robust legal framework that will ensure that competitors and marketplaces do not engage in activities that, in effect, squelch competition. Mm, okay. This has been a perennial problem getting back to the founding era of the United States. One great, great, great concern was monopolies and crony corporations. Look at the bank uh, debate over the Bank of the United States, for example, especially the first Bank of the United States, and you see a lot of anxiety that there will be a corporation, 20% owned by the United States government, that will in effect then be like, well, a vampire squid, right? Will have too much influence, will in effect allow for a kind of oppression, as you just put it, by a nominally private institution that is connected very strongly with the government. So this notion that one danger of government is that it will give special privileges to private parties that will then use these special privileges obtained from the government to engage in oppression, that was one of the motivations for the American Revolution. American, the American Revolutionary Generation looked at the British Empire and said, this is what is going on. That's hmm. what they often meant when they talked about corruption, that the government in essence creates rents and then distributes favors. And then what do we have? A whole lot of private entities who have monopolies or some other kind of special privilege with enormously detrimental effects for freedom. Okay, could, could I just stop you there? So is the, the founders spoke about corruption? Was that something frequently yes. on their lips? And Absolutely. When they talked about corruption, my model of corruption is there's a government official and you pay off the government official in exchange for some favor. It's, yes. uh, it's quid pro quo corruption. Are you speaking of that kind of corruption or something akin to it, but not exactly that? This kind of this definition of, a, of corruption is much broader, but the terms corrupt and corruption are everywhere in huh. the revolutionary and so early national period. What are period. they thinking of when they speak of corruption? They're concerned about quid pro quo corruption too, of course. The standard, you go to a government official and you bribe him so he gives you a building permit or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But corruption had this broad meaning of a rotten society, one in which there wasn't a level playing field, one in which all men were not able to behave as if they were created equal which of course the founding generation thought all men are created equal. But in a society where the government is distributing special privileges and so forth, picking winners and losers, then it really, um, people are not able to identify and develop their talents. So, so what would be an example of uh, corruption in the view of the founding generation as they looked at the British Empire? What would be an example of their, their vision of, of corporate corruption? A government granted monopoly. Okay. And there were a lot of government-granted monopolies. And even though uh, the United Kingdom in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries was a place of extraordinary dynamism, it was also a place of a lot of sclerosis and frustration because many who had great ideas and wanted to form firms and compete with existing firms simply could not do so. So thinking more about the 1980s, there was an understanding that antitrust, which was a concern not only at the time of the founding, also throughout the 19th century, you think about the concentration that occurred in a lot of sectors of the United States uh, economy in the late 19th century, the so-called Gilded Age, 
monopoly again as a concern came to the fore. The result was major statutes, including the Sherman Antitrust Act, that were very broad and were intended to give the government the power that the government would need to ensure that private power didn't get out of control. But by the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of frustration with the antitrust framework and how it had been enforced, with many pointing out, and I think often with excellent reason, that the antitrust laws themselves had been used as a way for private interests who had influence over the government to convince the government to use the antitrust laws to beat up on their competitors. And so the government stepped back in the 1980s from vigorous antitrust enforcement. It's not that antitrust enforcement went away, of course not. But it stepped back, and that may have contributed some to the concentration in certain industries that you referred to just now. There are other factors, too, though, I emphasize. I think about the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act passed in 2010 also. Those laws, uh, I argued at the time, uh, were blueprints for additional concentration in the health and financial industries, respectively. Okay. Let me. Th so this is fascinating, but I, I'm a little skeptical. So if I may, yes. I, I have a skeptical question. So one part of the picture that you're painting for us, I think, is that antitrust enforcement was reduced, and that led to consolidation uh, could in have. various industries. Could and be a factor. Could be a factor. I, I, okay. I can't let me, let me just spell out this. this could be uh, a factor. Uh, let me spell it out, yes. and then we'll talk about what, how much of a factor it is. Uh, the idea is antitrust enforcement was reduced. That contributed to more consolidation. And indeed, we've seen a lot of consolidation in quite a lot of industries and in, uh, in airlines and in um, retail selling and so on. That led to concentration of market power. And then the picture is firms could indulge their ideological preferences because they didn't face as much threat from competition. If you have uh, a large pool of the market, you know, what are customers supposed to do? They either don't use this good or service whatsoever, or they use one that's produced by a political rival uh, because they don't really have a choice. The thing that makes me skeptical is that doesn't explain why the firms themselves are populated by people of, uh, at least at the top, who are so much on one side of the political division. I mean, it might explain why if you have a firm if you have a Republican firm, it expresses itself in Republican ways. If you have a Democrat firm, it expresses itself in Democrat ways. It doesn't explain why every tech firm um, valued at more than $100 billion is 90% uh, or more Democrat. Well, there are a couple of things going on. I mean, one is that firms that are protected from competition will often engage in various kinds of slacking. And you're right, virtue signaling or some kind of expression of beliefs might be one aspect of that slacking. But it's very important to note that not all CEOs lean one way or the other politically. Uh, I suspect that a lot of CEOs who are Republicans are a little bit quieter these days mm. uh, for, for, for various reasons. The, um, I'm not suggesting that the idea that some firms are protected from competent from the the vigors of the competitive marketplace is a perfect explanation yeah but i am suggesting it might be a factor in addition because government has remained so powerful we can explain again i don't know for sure but it gets over the plausibility hurdle at least for me the possibility that a number of firms are attempting to please government because the deregulation, quote unquote, of the 1980s, as I just uh, mentioned, was not a massive reduction in government power. In particular, ideas that the Constitution provide robust protections for economic liberty, thereby significantly limiting the regulatory power of government, those ideas never got much momentum in the 1980s. And so we remain a nation where the state governments have very broad police powers under which state governments can engage in heavy regulation of commerce and a world in which the United States government has also very strong powers, in particular under the Commerce Clause. They can regulate vigorously and they do. And so what I see is that for-profit firms very often are eager 
not to be on the bad side of the government. And if they believe, and again, this is something that I have heard expressed, we do not, we cannot know for sure whether or not it is true or not, but if those who are running profit-seeking firms have concluded with some reason that one political party, one major political party, is more likely than the other to engage in vigorous regulation of the economy, that it just so happens is more likely to benefit their supporters than their opponents, well then, a lot of what you've just described makes eminent sense. Well, another skeptical question. Um, I think it's clearly true, as you say, that uh, we have a lot of government involvement in business, that there's just a lot of regulation. I think about you know pharmaceutical companies and they're acting in the shadow of FDA approval. Their, their whole operation depends on FDA approval. And um, that means they're constantly subject to sort of regulatory oversight. And the same with any kind of securities firm, really any business whatsoever is it's, pretty much operating in the shadow of regulatory approval. It's not just the FDA for pharmaceutical firms. Remember that approximately half of the healthcare dollars spent, very roughly, are spent by government. And so if you are running a pharmaceutical firm, you have to understand that the government is one of your biggest customers, if not your biggest you, customer. You mean through Medicare and Medicaid, for exactly. example. Exactly. Yeah. Other, uh, so point taken. Other things too. So you would- Tremendous involvement tremendous. of government in the healthcare tremendous. business and uh, significant, if only slightly lesser involvement in other lines of business. That said, how do you make the last step that, that this very leftward orientation of the firms um, is on account of their trying to please government. I mean, government uh, switches pretty regularly uh, between um, federal, excuse me, Republican and Democrat on the national level. And on the state level, a lot of the states are red and some of them are blue, so it's divided. The government is divided, politics is divided, but the firms seem more like a lobby group on the progressive side. I mean, they, they're they rather unified relative to government itself. So it, I would think, if anything, government would tend to make them less left-wing than they are. Well, two things. First, if it is correct, as many have argued, and again, this gets over the plausibility hurdle, if it is correct that one major political party is committed to more vigorous regulation, then it makes sense for many who run for-profit firms to be more nervous about the political party that is more enthusiastic about regulating the economy than the political party that has, as one of its most important guiding principles, less regulation of the economy. So to me, that's not hard. Second is the role of ideology. And here we come to your expertise. You are the person in this conversation who has studied ideology much more than, than, than I have. Uh, this fire in the minds of men, as Dostoevsky put it, is absolutely a factor, I think, in every society everywhere. And we certainly have seen some fiery ideas, I would say, catch on. Ones that, if you're pointing out that the holders of these ideas appear to be, or at least some of the holders of some current ideas, seem to be at least some of the time engaging in behavior that is not, at least from some perspectives, in their own long-term best interest, I agree with you. And it's always interesting when one sees that or thinks one might be seeing that, it's always interesting to ask why. So maybe I'll turn the question <laughs> back on you. I mean, why do you think that we see this? I will note that some of this is self-correcting. I've been watching uh, the uh, uh, corporate America very carefully during this, the, um, the ESG investing, uh, for example, which uh, has um, an, an ESG initiatives. We have seen a retreat recently both in ESG investing and in uh, companies themselves talking about their ESG initiatives, in, in fact. And, and part of this is, I think, that, um, that maybe some of the, the fervor has worn off. Uh, it's also the fact that it's become clear that some of these actions were not promoting corporate, the corporate mission of, most importantly, uh, creating value for shareholders. And in a reasonably competitive economy, and we do have a reasonably competitive economy, it will occur to people running for-profit firms that they cannot, cannot engage in more than so much of this yeah. sort of behavior that is not ultimately benefiting their shareholders. Now, universities have much more uh, 
ways to uh, indulge this sort of They're more behavior. insulated then from competitive pressures. But may I, may I just return to a theme here? So I, I, I want to drill down a little deeper um, because of my feelings of puzzlement and my uncertainty about whether what's going on is the free market doesn't behave as expected or we're experiencing some distortion in the free market. The, the picture that you've, you've emphasized that this is multi-factor and I want to I want to uh, note that. Um, but you've emphasized to some extent the desire of businesses to please government, right? And right. they're so regulated, so thoroughly regulated, they're trying to please government and they sense that one party is more uh, willing to regulate them than others. And the picture is that the leadership and the businesses themselves are not deeply ideological or are di of divided ideologies, but they're trying to sort of please a master who is more ideological or who presents certain ideological risks. That isn't my picture of the people involved. Um, I know uh, a number of the people who make my conservative students scared at law firms. I know some of the people in the hospitals. I know some of the people in uh, finance. I think you do as well. And they're not just trying to please some outside influence. That's not what's moving them. Um, they are, in fact, the um, uh, executive set within their various businesses. They're the doctors, they're the leading administrators, they're the law firm partners, they're the consulting firms, managing directors. They're people of influence within their various for-profit institutions. And they strongly believe in certain values and they're using the power at their disposal to promote those values. They're not doing it to please government, notwithstanding the fact that they themselves are more uncertain or agnostic or on the other side or moderate, they're doing it because they believe it. And I, I feel like that part's being minimized is how how we got um, uh, personnel in in the leadership so side of our major corporations or the skilled labor side of our major corporations that was largely on one side of the political aisle. But believe what? You say believe it. And it's very interesting to me that you can't define it. And we are living in a world where there have been enormously fast shifting, um, fast shifts in the uh, goals and mission of the Democratic Party. Maybe the Republican Party too, but this gets complicated to me. So for example, take free speech. Free speech for a long time, I'm oversimplifying obviously, was identified as a quote, left-wing cause. And then, in our lifetime, we saw a flip. So that now, anyone like us who goes around extolling the benefits of free speech and freedom of thought is immediately identified, at least in many eyes, with the right. So when you see people who are willing to change their commitments mm. just because this is now the thing to do, I'm not sure that what they're doing is expressing any values or principles or even strong convictions. They are possibly just going along to get along. They're ambitious people. They want, and that's fine. And so it turns out that in order to rise in an organization, it's better to have these beliefs. It turns out they have these beliefs. It has not surprised me at all that when things got a little bit tough and when it became apparent, that it might be a bad thing for profit-seeking firms to engage in a bit of the behavior that you were just describing. Disney is an excellent example. What we see is the corporation actually step back a bit. Hmm. Disney uh, is looking, to my eyes anyway, less politicized these days. We'll see, I'm watching carefully. They seem to have, I think, taken some big hits potentially from uh, having uh, gone in an ideolo overtly ideological direction. I think it was unwise uh, and they seem to be thinking better of it. We've seen similar uh, developments with other, um, with other for-profit firms. And so I'm not suggesting that everything that you discussed, you just described that causes you concern um, is obviously self-correcting and the problems that you just described are going away. But we certainly have seen uh, changes, significant changes in the last year or two. 
and I haven't even gotten to Twitter, which mm -hmm. now is to me anyway an extraordinary platform uh, where a lot of ideas are permitted and where I am seeing people put out all kinds of very important, fascinating ideas and get, oh sure, they often get a lot of abuse or a lot of denunciation and so on and so forth. But you know what? I'm seeing lots and lots, idea lots of ideas uh, generate responses that are constructive engagement, both supportive and also skeptical. I think this is wonderful. Can you define crony capitalism for our, for our viewers? And let's let's turn to that now. Let's really yes. focus on it. What is crony capitalism? I would say it's probably a bit of a misnomer in all candor because I would say crony capitalism is not true capitalism. Crony capitalism is when there is a nominal market. You're not told that the government owns the means of production and that the government controls the distribution of goods and resources. But you are told, in effect, yes, there's a market. But it turns out that the market is so dominated by the government or by those who are closely connected with the government that, in fact, uh, there is very little competition. And it's called cronyism, crony capitalism. Yes. Crony, uh, cronyism because, is probably better. Because of the relationship between business leaders and political leaders. It's sort of like the only way you can succeed in business is to know the right governmental figures. And there's a sort of cooperative yes. relationship where people leave government for business positions where they get rich and leave business positions for government where they make sure that the regulatory apparatus favors their friends. And there's a sort of revolving door relationship that makes sure that this unity is maintained and particularly tends to stifle competition from upstarts who are from outside the social world of the business slash politics elite. Yes, Fair? that is essential to stifle competition. If <laughs> competition is not stifled, the whole thing doesn't work. So I would prefer cronyism or even corruption. Although, as you point out now, corruption usually means quid pro quo. Yeah, but yeah. I like the definition of corruption as used in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So you could call it like corruption broadly defined. You could call it crony capitalism, or you could just call it cronyism. It's yeah. about the relationship between government and business. Yes, I guess, cron and, and, and I prefer cronyism because, again, it's not capitalistic. It's, it, 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 although it, it, it wears the shell of capitalism, right? It's, it, it's in effect that the, 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 the market has been hollowed out, but that the, the garment, the exterior garment of the market is being worn. And then uh, people on the left will often say, perfectly understandably, you see, markets are not actually delivering what people need. I have a funny anecdote about this, moderately funny. I, when, I was, um, when Obama was elected uh, the first time, I was about a year out of law school. And um, all of these friends and you know, fellow recent graduates of law school flowed into the administration and stayed there somewhere between four and eight years, you know, depending on how their careers worked out. And almost all of them exited to the big finance firms. It didn't matter what their prior background was. Many of them knew nothing about economics. They had done, you know, law stuff. They had done like constitutional law in the Obama administration, but they all exited into um, uh, hedge funds, private equity firms, and similar kinds of financial firms where they immediately made seven figure incomes. And, uh, and I remember thinking, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, they don't have any of the relevant training makes, and wondering for the first time in my life, is this crony capitalism or whatever we want to call it? It makes complete sense by your own description. If what these firms, these financial firms need are people who can assess and monitor political risk. Right. Political risk is never absent. I would never suggest that even in the freest of markets that there is no political risk. And in my work on takings, all right, on, and, and the Fifth Amendment, and the power of government to regulate property and to actually flat out take property through the operation of eminent domain, I work a great deal with concepts of political risk. But how much political risk there is and how much attention financial firms have to pay attention, must pay to it, depends upon, well, how, how things are going in politics. And when I see a number of people whose expertise is identifying, assessing, and monitoring political risk get jobs at big finance firms, 
what that suggests to me is that big finance now thinks that it is facing serious political risks and it needs to staff up to deal with yeah. them. And that's what my friends tell me, actually. They say that uh, uh, there's other people who are partners at the firm because they do the number stuff and they're there to talk to people in government. Right. It's not even like assess political risk in the sense of like reading the newspaper and making judgments. It's talking to people in politics to reduce political risk, I guess you could say. They're assessing it too. Yeah. Their conversations um, assess and reduce. And it raises, of course, um, very difficult questions because, as you point out, um, this can give firms a powerful competitive advantage if they have on staff people who routinely talk to government and are getting material non-public information from government. Mm. We have in our securities um, uh, regulation regime, we have tried very hard. It, of course, is impossible to do perfectly, but we have tried very hard to make financial markets a level playing field or a level-ish playing field such that those who hold material non-public information about particular firms will be severely limited in their ability to trade on it and make money from those trades. But we are in an era where still those who have access to political players will be able to collect material non-public information and make money off it. I think that is something that we need to think about very seriously how are we going to limit this? So if I could bring it back to the question that motivated our whole discussion, um, the thing I just I just can't figure out is, you know, were Reagan and Milton Friedman and Margaret Thatcher and the other, you know, um, leading ideas people and political people of that era just wrong about free market leading to a free society, leading to political freedom. I don't. And in fact, Free markets can easily lead, as they have, to sort of political domination by our corporate, by our, by our profit sector, for profit sector. Or is this not really the free market? I say this is not anything like what one would call a free market. Okay. These are highly regulated markets where there are opportunities for the strong players to work with government in order to frustrate competition. I think the pronouncements of Margaret Thatcher in particular have actually aged extremely well, except for one, the one where she said there is no such thing as society. I understand what Margaret Thatcher meant. She was trying to call attention to the fact that ultimately how well things go depends on all of us as individuals, and no single individual in a society can shirk. A society is made up of individual people who need to be on balance making good decisions. But in saying that, she, I think, made people forget about the importance of community, the importance of non-market institutions to the wealth, to the functioning of markets. Forget about the half of Adam, the, the part of Adam Smith that emphasized uh, moral development and virtues. Okay, so I should, the thought here is, you know, if, if you're a friend to individual freedom, if you're unhappy with what's happening in our for-profit corporate realm, uh, ideologically, uh, the answer is not to turn away from free markets. The answer is to recognize that we don't have a truly free market, which is to say a truly competitive market, and to try to restore uh, a genuinely free, genuinely competitive market with less government involvement, less cronyism, and so on. Yes, exactly. Think a lot about the promise of information technologies, including AI. Think a lot about antitrust and how to craft a better antitrust regime. Things of that sort, not to suggest that markets have been tried and have failed. I, I just have one more question before we wrap up this first hour of our talk together. Um, it's along these same lines, but it's more concrete. Let's say someone gets fired from their law firm because of their tweets. Um, is that a kind of tyranny? Should we classify that as a kind of tyranny? Doesn't in, in asking that an associated question, does it matter what the tweets say? Yes. Like certain things, yeah, you should get fired for saying that, but other things you shouldn't, and it's a question of line drawing. What it seems to me that it's in these market relations where you worry that like. Uh, 
this tweet or even this position at my PTA meeting will get me fired from my job. Um, that's where people encounter power. They don't encounter power because of the old image of, you know, the police knocking at the door and disappearing you. Uh, they encounter power in those market relations where they worry about expressing who they really are because of its professional effects. And likewise, is it, is it and should it be lawful for a private firm to fire you because, say, you oppose the trans movement or oppose the Black Lives Matter movement as a movement? Um, is allowing firms to have that kind of control over their employees consistent with free market values or is it antithetical to free market values? Well, there is always going to be a line drawing problem. You're absolutely right. It's possible that political convictions could be added to the list of qualifications and attributes uh, for which firms can't fire their employees. Uh, there's certainly been a, a, I'd say not a strong movement, but, but, but a bit of a movement, right? There's some municipalities, for example, that have protections in the civil rights laws for political affiliation. Uh, that's certainly a direction that we could go in. I think ultimately, though, there have to be uh, discussions that are honest and thoughtful in a society about where that line is drawn. If an employee is tweeting out threats to kill other employees, uh, that is a problem. And of course, that's going to result in firing. We have lived in a, we are now living in a society where at least um, in recent years, there have been examples, and you mentioned some of them, where people have been fired or been deprived of professional opportunities for things that seem fairly trivial. Now, there's been enough publicity about this, and uh, so few people support it, that this actually might be self-correcting. We might have seen, in other words, the acme of the cancellation movement, and we might be returning to a calmer, uh, calmer environment. If we continue on, in an environment where it seems that a lot of people are afraid to engage in reasonable discussions in, um, in a reasonable way because of cancellation, then we're going to have to think more about what we can do in terms of both changing laws and in terms of how we will change our society. You know, I was uh, in high school, the first part of college in the 90s, and I remember um, the movement that is now called the woke movement uh, was then called political correctness and identity politics. And all around me, I heard that this movement has reached its acme and it will now recede. There are self-correcting forces that will slow it down. Um, Alan Bloom's famous book, Closing of the American Mind, was about the power of this ideological movement. And uh, uh, it was written in, I, I believe its copyright date is 1987. That sounds right. Um, and everyone thought it had sort of crested and would recede, but it didn't. It kept going. And then as I was, you know, graduating from college in the very early 2000s, I was told the movement has crested. It will now recede. It just continued getting stronger. And then I remember in law school, in the mid-2000s, I was told it was it crested, it will now recede, and it didn't. And now I'm just hearing again, you know, um, maybe with COVID or with Trump or, or something or other, it is crested and now will recede. Always there are these self-corrective mechanisms that are cited. Never in my life have I seen it. Uh, I'm a middle-aged man now, and I have uh, been interested in this phenomenon for my entire life. And I have heard predictions about the cresting and self-correcting and receding, and they've never come true. Now, I guess twice a day, a, a stopped clock is right, right? But maybe the analogy isn't to a pendulum that, that self-corrects mm -hmm. back to center. Maybe the analogy is to a snowball roll, rolling downhill where it just gathers steam and it's continuing. So what's your explanation? Because I view you as an expert on, on ideology and the grip that it has on people. Is this, is this what you think is going on? I think that there is a, um, um, a class consciousness, what Marx termed a class consciousness. Uh, uh, and essentially, the people who have uh, uh, gone to prestigious schools uh, and even semi-prestigious schools who have joined the educated classes and gotten the kind of jobs at the, 
at the uh, heights of our institutions that come with those those educations uh, share a common um, ideological orientation, overwhelmingly so, uh, and have shown that power comes from being at the heights of these institutions. Now, some of these institutions are governmental, and so you have this class consciousness in many of our administrative agencies and our state and federal government uh, units. But um, uh, these institutions are also non-governmental. They're for-profit, they're not-for-profit, they're corporate, they're law firms, they're hospitals, they're whatever they are, but you have essentially the same class consciousness in all of them. And I think that class consciousness, um, re, uh, it, first of all, it's it's passionate. It's, it's, it's held with religious fervor by some. And as you pointed out, by a, with a sort of more casual, this is what will get me ahead uh, uh, conviction by others. But the combination is such that you have all of the people in, not all, uh, the overwhelming majority of the people at the in positions of institutional leadership sharing a common set of ideological or political convictions, largely on the progressive side. And they reassert themselves. They, they're like fraternities. They pick future members and they control who future members can be. If you want to get a job at the hospital, you have to be hired by the people who are who have jobs at the hospital now, the doctors and administrators, likewise the law firms, likewise the universities, likewise the government agencies. So the, the population, it, it, it doesn't self-correct. It reinforces itself over time and gets ever more extreme. And I don't believe there is any self-corrective mechanism that will ever work. I think the only, sorry, just to finish this thought, uh, you did ask. Uh, I think the only um, mechanism is uh, majoritarian power, democratic power versus institutional power. Yeah, that sounds right. And what you've described is a classic class consciousness that will protect them from competition. What you're describing is, in effect, a world where those who don't know how to conduct themselves, who use the wrong word, uh, who don't have the right credentials, will not be able to be in the mix for a lot of very desirable jobs. I mean, so it's just a classic ruling class. And right. the ruling class is the perfect term. And the ideology then, there really doesn't seem to be much of one. Again. Oh, there is one, but it, you're right. It's somewhat flexible. It's the ideology of the ruling class. You adopt it in order to be part of the class. And where the ideology changes, you're, as by your, by your description anyway, the beliefs of these individuals will change. So I think you're absolutely right that for something like that, democracy is the only answer. Oh, so this is interesting. So when... Let's say the problem is defined as an ideologically unified ruling class. And a ruling class rules in different domains. It rules in government, it rules in for-profit corporations, it rules in other nonprofit institutions, just rules, right? When I think about the solution to an ideologically unified ruling class, I think about the lawmaking power of democratic majorities. You think about that too, but you think about think about another thing too. You think about competition. I mean, how do you break a ruling class? You break it with competition. And so the question then would be, what policy interventions would make society more competitive so that you can't be just sort of a member of the ruling class in virtue of the combination of your credentials and your ideology? Is that fair? Well, one thing that I think can be enormously helpful, we are already seeing which is the removal of degree requirements for a number of jobs. Yeah. I think that is huge. It was a very big mistake to move away from the idea that employers should be able to hire someone who hasn't been to college or maybe hasn't been to, and give that person a chance. So when I see a step back from the degree requirements that had become so common, particularly the bachelor's degree, I think this is excellent. I also think you need to uh, have more competition in uh, for-profit firms and more competition in, the, in, in um, the nonprofit sector, especially universities, which we can talk about more in the second half of our yeah. program. If we have more real competition, then that will, in effect, put pressure on those who run these institutions to find talented people who are not and not just replicate themselves. 
I have this crazy policy idea, and I wasn't planning to ask you about it in this interview, but I want to just throw it out there because it's so apropos of our conversation. I just want to see how you'll react. Um, let me put this out not as a firm, like we should do this, but as a sort of uh, a thought experiment. What if we made it uh, among the things you can't discriminate on the basis of, right? We have race and national origin and sex and disability and so on. If we added to the things you can't discriminate on the basis of pedigree, that is to say, where you graduated from. So you can't favor, legally can't favor, and let's assume we can make it enforceable, uh, someone with a Harvard degree over someone with my hometown where my mom was a professor, University of Alaska Fairbanks degree. You just can't. What you can do is give them, and in fact, you're required to do this by law, we can imagine, uh, to the extent possible, give them both a test for performance. And if the UAF computer science programmer can outprogram the the Harvard computer science programmer, that person is entitled to the job, notwithstanding the difference in their degrees. Or like with law firms, uh, if the the law firm has to have them write a memo or write a legal brief and has to um, evaluate them uh, and anonymously, and the person who can write the better brief or memo gets the job over, and that will force the pedigreed institutions to actually train their people better or lose in a competitive marketplace. I mean, what do you a, think? It's an interesting idea. It's, it would, I mean, you would, of course, have the uh, uh, response that that's just one short behavior sample as opposed to a degree from a challenging place that presumably reflects a lot more work. But it's interesting. Well, what if, it's, what if that we have doubts about that premise that the challenging place really is more challenging? I can tell you, as someone who has taught at a number of universities, um, the great inflation at elite schools is unbelievably rampant, and uh, they're not genuinely more challenging than the non-elite schools. So I would, all things being equal, I would like to impose fewer, not more, requirements on employers. If they, if this, if what you say is true, the employer should be able to figure out for themselves that they need to change course. And I have heard anecdotally about employers who are less, far less impressed with degrees from fancy schools than they used to be. But maybe this is where we part so, ways, because I think the solution is to use democratic power to impose pro-competitive um, requirements on the private sector. And it sounds like you would really rather avoid legal requirements. I would not have that as my first choice. I think that there are just a staggering number of requirements that many businesses have to comply with and that that in and of itself puts a very, very, very strong thumb on the scale in favor of the sorts of people you were just describing who are members of what you identify as a ruling class and they are selected for membership in part because they are so familiar with this world of of um, of intense regulation, and someone who just shows up, who isn't used to, who doesn't think about how the um, government works, who doesn't understand how government officials will say view an application to do business and so on and so forth, is at a big disadvantage. I would like to roll things back, not to get rid of, of course, very important health and safety regulations. I believe that governments must have powers to order society and that those powers are going to be strong in some areas, particularly health and safety. But all sorts of regulations that are hard to navigate are the friend of those who know the rules and come from pedigreed backgrounds, etc., etc., and the enemies of those who are trying to get somewhere in this world. Julia, thank you so much. We'll continue in our second hour. That was absolutely fascinating for me and I hope for others. Oh, thank you. Bye.